multimedia initiative highlighting energy efficient technologies for Manitoba's diverse communities, including newcomers and refugees. By addressing barriers such as availability and awareness, it aims to educate and expand the market for these technologies. My name is Ryan Funk. Join me as we explore efficient technologies and programs here in Manitoba with Green Toba. We are, um, yeah, thank you too for the uh, invite here. Um, BioHeat is um, a company that uh, specializes in environmentally friendly um, products uh, to uh, sell, uh, sell and um, service and install. We uh, especially like uh, geothermal, uh, outdoor boilers, air source heat pumps, um, solar panels, anything like that, that will help the environment. Um, yeah, we've been in business since, uh, well, doing this kind of thing for probably close to 20 years. Well, first of all, it just kind of happened, but now that we are in this, uh, this whole uh, business, we realize that uh, there's limited um, availability for qualified installers and uh, dealers and such. And we realize it's a market that does uh, need service and um, we are happy to provide that. And we feel it is very important. What sort of technologies are available through BioHeat Resources? When someone's coming to you, what sort of things can they expect to find? Well, they can uh, come into our store and first thing you'll see obviously will be uh, wood stoves and fireplaces. But uh, behind the scenes um, is wood sto outdoor wood boilers, and then very much so the air source heat pumps and geothermal uh, systems. That is definitely our specialty is the geothermal. So there's a wide variety. Let's, let's go through each of them. So you mentioned wood stoves and then outdoor boilers and, uh, and things like that. But these aren't your typical like furnaces, right? These are a little bit different. Yeah, so the wood stove is, uh, as you would see in a home um, or fireplace where you're going to have a chimney wood stove and you're going to load it with wood on a daily basis um, as needed. The outdoor boiler is uh, situated typically outside or in a big shop. Um, again, it is it can be then uh, used to heat your shop or home. And two, it uses wood as the main uh, heating source. Geothermal, I mean, that's the one you were talking about. And we've heard a lot of talks around the province about changes, specifically from our NDP government, talking about implementing at least some geothermal. What exactly is geothermal for someone hearing about it? It's like, well, wait, how how does this work? Well, what What is this technology? Okay, good question. Yeah, so geothermal is... As the word even implies, geo being earth and thermal being heat source. So we want to uh, take what the earth is already providing. It has a layer of heat. Um, we usually go about six, eight feet deep if you're going to go a horizontal loop, for instance. But um, taking the grounds, um, the earth's uh, energy, this heat, and bring it into your home as your heating source. So um, we take some pipe and some uh, system that looks like a furnace but it doesn't quite have the same components. We um, then pump it through your house uh, and much like the electric furnace, it'll have a blower and it can push the air, air, the heat throughout the house. Technology like this saves in the long run because you're, you're getting heat from the earth. You're not having a furnace or something creating it. That's right, yes. Yeah, we're uh, typically seeing anywhere from four to five times the energy savings uh, using a geothermal compared to a standard electric furnace. Wow, that's very significant. Right, yeah. The final one, air source heat pumps. Uh, what exactly is that and how does that work? So an air source heat pump, instead of taking from the uh, ground as we do with the geothermal, we take from the air. And so we, we even have cold climate uh, units already where we can take air that's minus 30 degrees Celsius and bring it into the house and heat your home uh, with the system as it is. And so, yeah, it too is very efficient and using the natural resource that's already available to us all. Okay. With these various technologies that BioHeat Resources offer, um, what sort of changes, and you mentioned a little bit with geothermal that people will see savings of upwards of four to five times in their energy, but when we're looking at all these technologies, how does that change someone's life? What, what does it look like once you have those things installed? It'll be like any other system. Um, the main thing is you're going to 
see great savings. So you, your energy bills should be way less. So you have more, you know, money to have as free spending uh, to invest in other things. Just basically it'll be a system once it's set up, it should last 25 years or so. And you could basically say, set it and forget it. You know, it, it should be there and you're good to go. Maybe some people have a little, maybe some concerns about geothermal. What, what does that installation look like? Are we looking at vertical, uh, vertical kind of pipes, horizontal pipes? What is that installation process? Depending on uh, your situation, each individual has uh, their own uh, unique uh, setup. So if I'm, uh, for instance, out in the country and I have a lot of uh, yard space and I don't mind uh, having it dug up, then I would need a bit of a plot of an area, 130 feet or so uh, wide, 20 feet um, or 130 feet long, let's say 20 feet wide. Then I would have a pit. That would be my horizontal loop that I could uh, set up there. If I'm in town or in a situation where I don't want my yard to be all torn up because I've already done my landscaping, um, then the vertical loop is a much better option. And both are basically equally efficient. Walk me through the consultation process. So someone comes to you and they're looking at new alternative heating options for their homes. They're not sure whether they want to go with a a wood furnace, geothermal, or an uh, air source heat pump. What do those early conversations look like? And then what are those next steps once they've figured out what they want to go with? Yeah, so uh, we kind of look at uh, what do they have available to them. Like if you are in a rural setting and you have a lot of uh, trees on your yard and bush to clean up and or a ready supply of wood, um, you know, so we would kind of feel that out uh, as you come along. We would definitely lead you toward that uh, avenue of wood stoves or outdoor boiler. If you're in a situation where you want low maintenance and you're looking just to uh, have a good, clean system, we'll definitely look at the geothermal system first option. If you're looking for something a little less costly, but still very efficient and benefiting toward uh, your home, then we'll look at the air source heat pump. So it's kind of just... They figured out, oh, I'm going to go with a geothermal system. Uh, After those consultation processes, what does the installation look like for each of these technologies? How long does it take to install a furnace? What is that process for geothermal? You mentioned digging, putting those uh, poles in the ground. And then air source heat pumps, getting that set up and connecting everything. What sort of timeline are we looking at for each of these different technologies? Well, it's actually very interesting, but each of these technologies actually has about the similar amount of time to install. It's about a day to day and a half, depending on the complexity, maybe even up to two days. Let's say a geothermal system, if we uh, start the day, uh, we'll start pretty much like seven or eight o'clock in the morning. We'll have the backhoe ready to go. He'll come and dig. We'll show him where he needs to dig and everything. And then as we'll lay our pipes, he will backfill and then we'll run the pipes to the house. And in the meantime, uh, then bring down the heat pump, get everything hooked up. And so, yeah, we're looking at a good day, day and a half, like I say, Uh, outdoor boiler, similar idea. The unit will be situated. The pipes will already have been dug in by the homeowner. We'll then uh, connect everything inside the house. There's some plumbing and uh, set up that way to do air source heat pump, similar to an air conditioning uh, system, if you can imagine that, uh, your outside condenser and then inside uh, connecting up. So, yeah, each is... Okay, so it it doesn't even take that long. That's that's really cool, you know, for someone who wants to see those changes. Having something that's that quick could be that one thing that's like, okay, yeah, maybe I will take these next steps absolutely so i guess when should people be reaching out to you so they're they're thinking about upgrading the installation can only take a day and day and a half but what is that process going from that first initial call to once uh shovels are in the ground yeah so we like to uh, do a site visit with you potentially if um, also take a look at how is your home uh, set up and where like how does everything fit there's things to look at, like your duct work sizing. Is it appropriate for the heat pump, for instance? Or, you know, just kind of looking everything over. It's, so we'll do a site visit. We're based on that, then uh, we'll also do some measurements for uh, heat loss calculation so that we can determine the size of the uh, unit you would require, be it the outdoor boiler or air source or geo. Everyone kind of needs, you know, we need to know kind of what's that heat load you have. 
And then based on that, we can make a quote and then you can uh, decide and we can provide quotes for any and all as alternative or options to consider. Is your installation only part of the year or is it something that you do year round? Uh, that's a good question. At Geothermal, we would mostly only do a replacement uh, in winter. Um, air source likely too, only in winter. Boiler as well. Because of the digging of the loop, if, if the loop was in place, we could do it any time of the year. But uh, if the loop needs to be put in, then um, after frost is out of the ground till before frost hits again. So, you know, late spring into... I mean, yeah, for uh, for obvious reasons, uh, the ground's frozen, makes digging a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's right. When someone is getting these installed um, and those initial consultation processes, are there any subsidies or programs people can take advantage of to help offset a little of those costs when upgrading to a geothermal system or uh, air source heat pump? Yes, there's some really amazing uh, grants and uh, uh, different funds available right now. Um, there's the Canada Greener Homes Grant. Uh, it's uh, offering $5,000, for instance, for a geothermal system up to. And Air Source Heat Pump has, I think, up to $3,000. Efficiency Manitoba also has a program, and uh, it even includes the thermostat or different other you know things that you can look at um, for adding to your um, grant. And then there's also a Manitoba Green Energy Tax Credit, which part of the install can be um, eligible for as well. So there's some really great uh, funding out there available. Mm -hmm. So Bioheat Resources will help people through that process once they uh, connect with you? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we can help you get the application going and finished, yes. For anyone who's listening and thinking about these technologies and maybe upgrading their systems uh, for their home, what would you say to them if they're maybe a little hesitant thinking about, mm, do we want to upgrade? Do we not? What sort of thing do we want to do? Uh, what sort of advice or conversations would you give someone who's maybe on the fence? I would say do it. Um, any of the options is really great to consider. Um, yes, it looks like a big uh, amount maybe up front when you're looking at um, doing a geo or outdoor boiler, whichever the air source you come. But I think in the long run, if you would do the math and you would consider the benefits, um, the comfort that you're getting, the you know savings that you're seeing, there is um, really good reasons to get uh, these green um, units. And especially now with the grants available, it's almost a no-brainer, I would say. It, it really does make sense. It reduces the costs over a long period of time. So if you're going to be living in a home for many, many years, this, this is a perfect opportunity and, you know, there's also that environmental impact. You're, you're focusing on technologies that are reducing your load on the environment. Absolutely. That's right. For someone who's interested and now they're like, you know what? Yes, I'm going to take those next steps. How do they get in contact with you? Where do they find out more information about Bioheat Resources and the technologies that you offer? Well, we can always be reached by phone at 204-331-4150. I can help you, and Ed is here, our boss as well. Also, our website, uh, bioheatresources.com, is out there. Yeah, just look us up. We'll be available for you. Where do you see the industry going based on just uh, your customers coming in, what you're seeing within um, other companies? Where do you see geothermal and some of these other green technologies in five years? Oh, this is only growing. Um People are looking to uh, always uh, improve the efficiencies in their homes. They're looking to help the green environment, like to help the environment get better. Yeah, this is only going to be growing and getting stronger. There's much we can learn from a business about these technologies. But what does it look like to live with them? Barrett Platt has various green technologies in his home, and he couldn't be happier. I'm a school counselor. Uh, we live in southern Manitoba. Uh, so we live rurally. We live about seven miles out of Morden. And because of that, we end up doing a lot of driving. And we have a house that is kind of like, I don't know, we, we enjoy being out in nature, but we sort of feel a little bit conflicted sometimes about the fact that everything we do needs driving. So um, yeah, and, and my wife works uh, in climate work. She works for a national church organization doing supporting climate change initiatives for that. I know we've talked before and you've told me a little bit about uh, 
your setup, but for our listeners, what sort of efficient, sustainable technologies do you currently have at your home? The two big ones, the two new ones um, are that we installed geothermal energy in our geothermal heating in our home. And we recently purchased an electric vehicle to replace a gas vehicle that we use for our commuting. And I think we've, we've lived in our home for about five years and the house itself was a pretty, it is, it's a quite an efficient home to begin with. So we were just looking at ways to, ways to get the most bang for our buck as far as like the, the ways that we're using the most energy or emitting the most carbon and trying to address those things. You live out in nature with your family, your wife is uh, working in kind of an environmental sector. And, you know, it can be hard as individuals to figure out how to reduce our impacts here on the planet. And of course, different sorts of efficient technologies are one way to do that. So what was your familiarity with sort of technologies, whether that was, like you mentioned that your home is quite efficient already. So I guess what is your familiar familiarity with things before you went through this process of installing geothermal? I think like uh, when we, when we've been looking at, like you said, like sort of minimizing our individual impact, recognizing that that's only part of the solution, but that we want to, you know, do things that, that have, we want to spend our time and our money doing things that have a, a proportionally big impact. So I mean, recycling is fine and it's good, but if we step up a recycling by 5%, it's not going to make us a, a big dent. But when we looked at what the biggest impacts, like if you do these personal carbon footprint calculators, it's transportation and home heating are, are two of the big four for people in our, our climate. And so we, we thought both of those things, transportation, like I said earlier, we, we have to do a lot of driving because we live in the country. And uh, home heating, um, we, we, had, we had electric heat, so it's like sort of carbon neutral in Manitoba, I guess, but it's, it's still like our electric bills were high every month in winter and we're using a lot of electricity. Um, and so we've been aware, like I've been aware of geothermal um, for a long time. My wife's father was actually a, like a plumber years ago and had put geothermal in their house like 40 years ago. So we were 30 years ago, like a long time. So I was aware of it. And we had also actually looked into solar. We, we got quotes on solar as well. So I would say I'm, I'm, I'm interested in these in efficient technologies. I, I wish there was more uptake by other people sort of, you know, everywhere because both of the choices that we've made now, I think in the end, they're more efficient and they're better. Like for us, they're as, as a homeowner, as a vehicle driver, both of the, both of the efficient technologies that we've invested in actually make our lives easier. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, the hope from conversations like this to inform individuals, like for newcomers who are coming here, for some of them, a lot of their initial needs might have not been met in the country where they're from. So maybe they haven't even had a chance to think about what sort of impact that has on the planet. And as Manitoba grows, we get more immigrants to our country or and to our province and as demand for electric vehicles increase, you know, the demand on the grid is going to grow as well. So having other options that help offset that is going to be beneficial as well. Yeah. And that was when we had looked at solar and we actually like, and you'll ask, I guess, about the the programs that we took part in to make this financially more, more appealing. But we had a like an energy audit done in our house and the energy advisor who did the audit, he recommended geothermal he recommended air source heat pump and he also recommended like solar and you know and or or hybrids of all of those systems and when we looked at it we thought if we can reduce the amount of energy that we need in total by the maximum amount then if we want to do solar or something like that later then it will be then we can work with that and we're using less energy that we need to get from solar I mean, we can talk about that already, like the different programs and initiatives that you were able to take advantage of. That was the Green Houses program or something like that. It's the federal version, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So for the geothermal, we participated in the Canada Greener Homes loan and the Canada Greener Homes grant. 
It was actually, it starts with the Greener Homes grant. You apply for that first. And then if you're given, if you're eligible for the grant, then you can apply for the loan, which helps to finance it. Yeah, interesting. And you were mentioning that an energy evaluator came to your home to look over the different areas and find out what would be the best course of action for you. Right. So that's the requirement of the Canada Greener Homes grant program that you have this energy audit. The guy came out from uh, Winnipeg. He spent, I think, about three or four hours at our house. I wasn't home. My wife was home when he came. But he measured insulation and looked at the windows and looked at our current setup and identified the areas that we would be able to do the most as far as saving energy and in- increasing our home's efficiency. And then we got a report with he gave us like three different proposals for what we could do, one of which was this geothermal, which is what with the ground source heat pump that we we uh, decided to do eventually. The other proposal was air source heat, and then he also proposed air, air source heat pumps with um, solar. And the reason we chose the ground source heat in the end was because that was the one that will bring our, our total energy consumption down the most. I mean, that's part of the thing, like trying to figure out what's going to work best for your setup. And as you mentioned, you already had kind of your your doors and windows were already kind of meeting expectations. But, you know, that's not always the case for everyone, especially people who may be living in older homes or lower income areas. Looking at data, the Canadian Energy Regulator, I think it's on average Manitoba's consuming like 9% more than the national average. And this is numbers back from 2019. And a lot of that's probably because, I mean, it's colder here in Manitoba. It gets pretty cold. Yeah. And if you have older buildings, you're generating that heat and then it's right back out through those windows if they're not efficient. Yeah. Well, and actually this is like we've owned, this is the third home that we've lived in in the last 20 years. And in in our first home, we lived in the West End in Winnipeg and we we upgraded our base, our our basement insulation and our attic insulation in that house. We also got some grant money for that. That was 20 years ago or something like that. But but the insulation upgrades were, I mean, they're not as fancy as exciting as geothermal, but way more impact than doing a different thing in in a city. Like it was a hundred year old house in the West End. And then the same thing in the house that we lived in previously. Also, we looked at geothermal and solar in that house. And again. I ended up getting, we did a a program through Manitoba Hydro where we were able to do insulation that was subsidized attic and basement and that dropped our costs and our energy uses tremendously in that house. For some of the subsidies and programs that you took advantage of for the geothermal, you mentioned a federal program. Was there any provincial programs that you were able to take advantage of? Yeah. So for the geothermal, there was the federal program and that's the one that we had to do first. Uh, When we installed the geothermal, then the installer, BioHeat, filed with us for Efficiency Manitoba, and then we also got a provincial grant. The amount that we ended up getting from the provincial grant was actually a little more than what we had gotten from the federal grant. Fantastic. I am under the impression that we also will get some money back on our income tax this year provincially as well. So the one thing I would say about the programs, like the federal program was very clearly laid out and well explained right from the beginning but it was very very slow the provincial program it was not as clear we weren't sure how much we like with the federal program we knew exactly how much money we'd get and what we were eligible for the provincial one maybe because it's done by the installers more we weren't as clear about what would what we would get out of the provincial one so it was kind of a pleasant surprise to get a big chunk of money from them and the other thing just about the programs When I talked to, I don't remember who who I talked to first, federal, provincial, but some of the people I talked to thought that we couldn't layer those onto each other. And BioHeat, at the time, they hadn't, I I think we were their first install with this Canada Greener Homes grant program, so they were unsure at that time whether we would be able to do both. But one of the people I talked to said directly that we wouldn't be able to do both, but then someone else, and I think it was the Canada one said not both, and the Manitoba said yes, or whatever. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But in the end, we were able to do both. So I think that's just a, a reality of dealing with programs at both federal and provincial levels, but I think there's a bit of persistence required from homeowners to make sure that they're accessing the grants, because both the federal program and the provincial programs, they want to give money to people. They want to do this. Um, so yeah, it was... That was just a little bit of a sort of a funny thing that they didn't know that they were compatible programs. 
Well, hopefully, as more people become aware of potential programs like this and take advantage of them, maybe that system will hopefully get a little bit more stream uh, streamlined and a little clearer. Yeah, and I've I've heard afterwards that the federal program, especially, has gotten a lot faster than it was when we were when we were doing it. it yeah, just even like shifting from the grant to the loan part, we couldn't start the work until we were approved, but the backlog for approval was kind of long and that's just I, I think they were hiring more people to process it so would they were installing geothermal like just for someone who's maybe not too aware of what that process is like do they have to like move out your whole house dig a massive hole out there destroy your whole lawn well <laughs> what did it look like sort of thing in the house, almost no impact. Like they replaced our existing furnace with the geothermal unit. They had to give us a new water heater to make space in our furnace room area, but it was just a matter of configuration. It didn't take a tremendous amount of additional space or anything like that. So the impact in the house was really negligible. I think like under a day of the install inside. Uh, the yard work where they were drilling the piping for putting the geothermal the the geothermal loop in, uh, it took a bit longer. It took about a week that he was in our yard. It wasn't like a no impact thing. It was it was disruptive to the yard. There was a a fairly large area in the end that was they had to dig out to to run the pipes and then also just to put the pipes deep into the ground. But I would say that like the total impact on our yard was maybe like a I don't know about a. 50 by 100 foot area in, in our yard. And like I said, we live in a rural yard. We have some space. That happened at the beginning of spring. We reseeded some grass on one of the parts, the part that with the trench that brings the pipes to the house. And by fall this year, you couldn't tell that there was a problem there. The grass actually looked better than the rest of our grass, probably <laughs> because we were paying attention to it. Yeah. And then the other part, we, we've been talking about doing some native plants and some prairie grasses and stuff in our yard anyway. So we decided we're just going to, take this as an opportunity since there's dirt there now anyway, we're gonna put some additional soil and manure in there and then seed um, like native grasses or things like that in the, in the messed up area. Well, that's just another step you can do, right? It's like there's efficient technologies and things that can change, but like there's also small things like that, like introducing native species back again into yeah. a lawn and on a yard that adds small impacts. Like we've been talking about that before, but it's kind of a lot of work to dig up existing grass. So in a way, it's like, OK, this guy with his excavator did it for us. And now we can put native grasses in yeah, there. Instead. It was an opportunity. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I know it hasn't been too long since you've had the geothermal installed and gotten this electric vehicle. But how would you say your life has been impacted or changed since you've uh, kind of taken these steps? I would say with the geothermal. So we've had both of them for about five months now. With the geothermal, I, I think in maybe the, the good answer is that our life actually hasn't changed that terribly much. Like it just heats our house simply and it just does the job in the background. The one thing I would say is that the geothermal cooling in summer and now switching to heating in winter, just really comfortable. Like it's so warm and steady and consistent throughout the house. So with our old system, we have an efficient house. It was like, it was fine, but it sometimes got cold or it's like they were in, in between cycles of the, the heating elements going on, it would cool off and there'd be drafty parts and the geothermal, it's like 20 degrees all the time. Like it's really smooth. Wow. That, I mean, that's really exciting that, I mean, first of all, that as you mentioned, your life hasn't changed too much, which is something you want to hear when someone is upgrading to things. You don't want it to be like, oh, we've had to change everything right. sort of thing. But I guess another exciting thing about this change is that you're reducing your impact on not only the energy grid, but on the planet as a whole. And and actually, we sort of see that like the other, so the other tech that we have is this electric car now and that i would say has had more positive changes than the geothermal because it's like super convenient to not ever have to go for oil changes and to basically have like a full tank every morning because we did both of those at the same time i can't really see on the like our electricity bill didn't go down when we went to geothermal which i had been looking forward to because our electricity well, now bill you're went charging, a car, right? charging a car right so our gas like our spending at gas stations is way down and our electricity bill has kind of stayed the same. But since June, when we got both of these things done, um, our electricity bill has almost been exactly the same 
every month since then. So that's kind of interesting too, because in like when we were previously on electric heat, our winter bills were way, way, way higher and our summer bills were, were way lower, but our, we spent more on gasoline in summer. But I think that like the geothermal in winter, it will probably be a little bit more expensive than it has been in summer. But the first five months of our geothermal, it's just a lot like some people use the equal payments plan with hydro. We're typically not on that, but I feel like having the geothermal has kind of smoothed that out because it's such an efficient technology that it previously in some of the coldest months in winter, we might have spent $600 in electricity to heat our house. Now it's going to sort of vary between two to $300 a month, kind of no matter what the temperature. So it kind of evens things out a little bit too, which is nice. Even things out and over the long run, you know, you're going to be, well, as you mentioned with gas and as we saw with during COVID, you never know when gas is going to all of a sudden just increase and skyrocket. So, I mean, you have that option that, you know, over the long period, you're probably going to be saving a good chunk of change. As far as prices go, like even natural gas, people who eat with natural gas or propane or whatever, Electricity in Manitoba is the most steady commodity, like heating source, right? Like the price per kilowatt hour has been very, very steady over the last 30 years in Manitoba. Whereas natural gas for heating or gasoline for cars, it's like up and down a lot more. So reducing our energy use and switching it so it's all electric makes it more predictable and really steady. Yeah, it kind of takes a little bit of that pressure off being like, is it going to increase? What's my right. budget going to look like this time? You kind of know what you're going to be getting into over the long run. Yeah. For someone who's listening to this and thinking about efficient technologies and sustainable energy sources, what sort of advice would you give them? Maybe some of, maybe some, uh, heads up for any challenges or hurdles that you might have faced yourself in this uh, process from kind of consultation to implementation? I, I would say just like be prepared for it to take a little longer than you expect, especially if you're doing, if you're accessing these programs, because sometimes you just have to wait on some paperworky side of things before you can move forward with action. So it's just a little more coordinating. I also think that even though we were able to access the grants and the loans, you have to be able to ha have financing available up front to pay some of these costs. And then the grants come, be come afterwards and you can to pay down. But at the, at the front, there's some costs. So you have to have a bit of financing available, either be able to borrow it or have some money money on hand for that. And I think the other advice would be to like talk to, I think, talk to installers, like especially about the heating side, like, they are the ones who know they we were when we thought we wanted to go with geothermal we had bioheat out to do a quote and they sort of talked about the pros and cons and they had done other installs in the area so they they had a lot of knowledge that they wanted to share with us too and i mean i guess they're also in the business of selling geothermal but it didn't feel like they were selling hard or that they were trying to pull the wool over our eyes or anything like it felt like they they knew a lot and they helped us to understand it as well well hopefully as things like this become more uh, aware to the general public and as more people take advantage of it, hopefully it'll open up more doors for someone. As you mentioned, you know, you have to have a little bit of capital in order to um, upfront to do some of these things. Hopefully, it, you know, those doors and barriers continue to reduce. Yeah. And I think even like with, with the capital up front, we went for ground source because like I said, it's the most efficient technology. But if we'd gone with air source heat pumps, it would have still been a significant upgrade over our electric and that would have been a lot less upfront. So I think there are options for people as well. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have those conversations, reach out to different installers or companies and just to kind of get an idea or a ballpark what you're looking at. Yeah. Amazing. Well, Barrett, thank you so much for taking this time to chat with us and, you know, help increase awareness about different options available to consumers and Manitobans. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to share? I just hope that people who are listening uh, get excited about doing doing things that have a big impact on the environment, but also I think in the long run on their pocketbooks too. And I think that that's what we're looking at here, that all of, all of the decisions that we made about this, about switching to energy efficient technologies, in the short term, there's some cash outlay, but in the, in the longer term, like, 10-ish years or so, we expect that these things will be saving us money and we'll have more in our pockets at the end of two decades than we would have otherwise. 
This project was developed in partnership with Efficiency Manitoba. Find out more from industry experts and community advocates at u-channel.ca slash greentoba. Thank you.